uh, welcome to this fourth lecture of the Medieval University and the Question of Education seminar series. So got some familiar faces here now, so I'll still introduce myself. Um, I'm Dr. Holly Hamilton Bleakley. I'm the director of the Medieval and Renaissance Studies Program here at USD, and so I coordinate this series. Um, as we talked about before, before, the seminar series is dedicated to studying the Medieval University as well as the idea of learning in the Middle Ages as it was practiced and understood uh, within various cultures. And we very much hope that this seminar series is going to generate important conversations and reflections on the purposes of higher education and how those purposes are carried out in a university system. Um, and of course, we hope it will generate more interest in the medieval and Renaissance period. And so it gives me great pleasure to introduce our fourth and final speaker for the series, Dr. Turner Nevitt. Um, Dr. Navit is an associate professor in the Department of Philosophy here at the University of San Diego. He is a graduate of the University of St. Thomas and Fordham University, where he received his, his MA, MPhil, and PhD. He works in medieval philosophy, metaphysics, and the philosophy of religion, and his publications include the first complete English translation of Thomas Aquinas' Quadlibetal Questions. Uh, he did that with Brian Davies. And the title of his presentation is Open Debate at the Medieval University of Paris, a look at Aquinas' quadlibetal questions. So please help me welcome Dr. Nevitt. Thank you very much, uh, Holly, for having me. Um, the uh, presentation I'm going to give is based on this text that she just mentioned that I translated with Brian Davis. Here it is, beautiful cover. Thomas Aquinas' Code Libero Questions. I see someone has it. Um, I spent many years translating it with um, Brian Davis, and it was published uh, spring of 2020, just in time for COVID to steal my thunder and prevent the book launch event that we had scheduled. So when Holly invited me to speak about the medieval university, I thought that this would be an opportunity to get my book launch back. Uh, <laughs> so, um, that uh, volume that I just um, held up is the first complete English edition of Thomas Aquinas' Cold Libido Questions. These questions are a collection of texts deriving from disputations over which Aquinas presided while teaching at the University of Paris, first from 1256 to 1259, and again from 1268 to 1272. Many of the questions discussed in the Cold Libids are also dealt with in Aquinas' other works, but some of them are unique. Taken overall, however, the quodlibidal questions give us a sense of Aquinas as a thinker that differs from what we find in his other works. For unlike in his other works, in the quodlibidal questions, Aquinas is responding to questions that were not of his own choosing. Rather, they were posed for him to answer in something like what we would think of as a town hall meeting, in which politicians field unexpected and unplanned for questions from both friends and foes. Normally, Aquinas wrote at his own leisure. He decided for himself what he wanted to discuss. But in the Quod Libus, we find his report of what he was forced by others to discuss in real time. By the middle of the 13th century, disputations had come to feature prominently as a method of teaching at the University of Paris. All Parisian masters of theology were formally required to lecture or comment on the Bible, to preside over disputations, these debates, and to preach. Hence, as a Parisian master of theology, Aquinas presided over disputations regularly. These regular disputations were called ordinary disputations, and they all took the same basic form. The presiding master or teacher would raise a question for debate of his choosing. One or more of his students would then be required to provide arguments for a possible answer. And finally, the master would determine or settle the question and comment on his students' previous arguments. Such ordinary disputations arose out of a respect for the value of dialogue and dialectic, which medieval universities and religious orders um, incorporated into their course of studies. These universities and orders had scholars commenting on various texts, which naturally leads to questions, first about what the text means, and then about how and why it is true. Such questions invite arguments for and against various interpretations and positions, which I think helped to motivate the rise and establishment of disputations in academic contexts by Aquinas's time. The general purpose of all disputations was to show how a greater understanding of the truth can come from debating and considering arguments on both sides of any given question. 
Aquinas himself evidently valued the practice of disputation. The published texts of his ordinary disputations clearly show this to be so, as does his commentary on the book of Job, where he characterizes the discussions between Job and his comforters as a disputation, disputatio. And in Aquinas's greatest work, the Summa Theologiae, the basic unit of discussion is effectively a mini disputation in which a question is raised, arguments on both sides are given, an answer to the question is defended, and then replies are made to each of the previous arguments that had been given against the answer defended to the question. Every article of the Summa shows the extent to which Aquinas took disputation to be a good method of teaching and learning. But whether he liked it or not, Aquinas was formally required to preside over ordinary, dis ordinary disputations, and these were of two different kinds. First, there was the public disputation, the disputatio publica, that masters held at regular intervals during the academic year. Disputations of this kind took place in the master's own school, in Aquinas's case, the Priory of Saint-Jacques. The master decided on the questions to be discussed in advance. He then appointed students to uh, take part in the disputation, which was advertised ahead of time. The dispute ran for one or two days, during which visitors from other schools, perhaps even other masters, raised points from the floor, usually in opposition to the position ultimately defended by the presiding master. These points were replied to by a student appointed by the master, normally his bachelor, and notes were taken on the whole proceedings. On the following day, or perhaps the following Sunday, the master returned and determined or settled the questions previously debated by stating and defending his own answers to them. Aquinas was also familiar, however, with disputations of a less public kind, the private disputation, disputatio privata. Disputations of this kind took place only between a master and his own students and bachelors. They seem to have been much more frequent than public disputations, but they took basically the same form. A question was chosen, arguments were advanced in defense of conflicting answers, and the master then determined or settled the question. It may well be that many of Aquinas's ordinary disputed questions, his De Veritate, his work on truth, or his De Potentia Dei, his work on the power of God, it, it may be that many of these originated in these private disputations between him and his own students. But the quodlibital disputations that he presided over were certainly public, fully public events. To what extent do any of Aquinas's disputed questions represent what was actually said on a particular occasion? And to what extent do they represent Aquinas's own views? Well, like many of his works, the published text of Aquinas's ordinary disputed questions came basically from his own hand. Masters of theology in the 13th century had the option to prepare an edited account of the ordinary disputations at which they presided and determined. This edited account, especially its determinations, should certainly be thought of as the work of the master. But masters did not script all the counterarguments offered during any given disputation. So their published disputations almost certainly incorporate ideas brought up by others. But these same ideas were evidently incorporated into the final text by the master himself, who should therefore be regarded as essentially their author. Nevertheless, the text of Aquinas's ordinary disputed questions most likely include much more than was said during the original discussions. As uh, Jean-Pierre Torel says of Aquinas's private disputations, quote, it appears probable that the final result does not resemble, except in a very general way, the real unfolding of these private discussions between the master and the students. It suffices to read the text of the De Veritate or the De Potentia to understand that these texts are very much above the level of what a discussion could be for average students. In other words, even though Aquinas's ordinary disputations uh, certainly put us in touch with a lively and relatively spontaneous debate, they're also very much the work of Aquinas himself and should be read as such. And the same can be said of his quod libido questions, although Aquinas had little control over the questions raised at the public debates from which they derive. In Aquinas's day, a quod libido disputation was sometimes referred to as a common disputation, disputatio communis, or a general disputation, disputatio generalis. Such common or general disputations differed from ordinary ones. They began to take place among theologians at Paris early in the 13th century, perhaps around 1230, 
and possibly in the study houses of Dominican and Franciscan friars. When Aquinas taught at the University of Paris, they only occurred over a few days during the seasons of Advent, that's in the fall, and Lent in the spring. Masters of theology were not obliged to conduct quadlibital disputations, and many of them never did so. And it's easy to imagine why a master might not have wanted to conduct quadlibital disputations, since they were open for anyone to attend and raise questions of their choice. As Brian Lawn observes, quote, literally anyone could attend, masters and scholars from other schools, all kinds of ecclesiastics and prelates, and even civil authorities, all the intellectuals of the time who were always attracted to skirmishes of this kind, and all of whom had a right to ask questions and oppose arguments. So a quadlibital disputation presented a willing master with a considerable self-imposed challenge. This gave masters quite a reputation uh, if they braved the floor of a quadlibal disputation. And um, you can see this even in the popular um, intellectual imagination when Boccaccio, who wrote the first biography of Dante Alighieri, wants to impress you with Dante's incredible intellectual acumen, he tells you that Dante traveled to Paris and held quadlibital disputations. He almost certainly did not do so. But um, nevertheless, that's the place that these events had in the medieval imagination. Um, so um, you can see why people would have been impressed by these debates, given how they were conducted. During the first day or the first part of such a disputation, questions could be raised in the presence of the master by anyone, a quo libet, and about anything, de quo libet, hence the name quod libital questions. At this initial stage, the master was probably able to relax a bit while one or more of his bachelors dealt with questions from the floor, though the master was entitled to make interventions and to try to come to the aid of the bachelors if he wished. He also had the prerogative to refuse to take a question. So the first part of a general disputation was a trial for the bachelors working under a master more than for the master himself, although it seems that some masters might well have weighed in at this stage to some extent. In any event, it's clear that masters had to prepare their formal determination or resolution of the questions previously raised and discussed, most probably be, uh, to be delivered in the presence of many of those who had attended the, the first stage of the general disputation. Masters had little time to prepare their determinations, maybe two or three days at the most, but they were obliged to provide these determinations, and in doing so, they had to impose some rational order on all that had been said at the general discussion, in spite of the fact that the questions came at random from the floor. So a master's scholarly and editorial abilities were definitely tested at this stage of the process. In due course, a master such as Aquinas was able, if he wished, to provide an edited account of the quodlibital disputations over which he had presided and determined. Aquinas himself provided edited accounts of almost all his quodlibital disputations, which would then be sent to the university bookseller, where they could be rented out for copying purposes. That's called medieval publishing. But these accounts cannot be taken as verbatim reports of all that was said and argued during the first part of the disputation or the subsequent determination. What they give us rather is Aquinas's account of what on reflection he wanted to present from the disputation as a whole. So his published quod libets connect us to events lying behind them at a certain remove and with an organization that is attributable more to Aquinas than to those present at the original discussions. Uh, there are 12 quadlibets in all among Aquinas's quadlibetal questions. Quadlibet 7 to 11 date from the first time that Aquinas functioned as a master of theology at the University of Paris. Quadlibets 1 to 6 and 12 date from his second Parisian regency. So the traditional numbering of his quadlibets, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc., is not the actual chronological ordering. So uh, if you open the table of contents of this book, you'll be disoriented by the fact that the quodlibets don't come in numerical order. One, two, three, four, we give them in the chronological order. So we start with seven and so on, um, which is the order that they come in the critical edition from which we translated them. So um, in spite of their length, roughly 150,000 Latin words, Aquinas's quod libets only constitute a relatively small portion of his enormous literary output. 
uh, roughly eight to 10 million words. And in spite of his respect for disputation as a method of teaching and learning, there's some reason to think he might not have been overly fond of the genre. In his foreword to the Summa Theologiae, a textbook for beginners in theology, Aquinas says that he thinks students of Catholic truth are, quote, greatly hindered by various writings on the subject, partly because of pointless questions, articles, and arguments, and partly because essential information is given according to the requirements of textual commentary or the occasions of academic debate. That phrase, occasions of academic debate, could be taken as a reference to quote libidal disputations. Aquinas evidently believed that essential information ought to be given to beginning students in a certain order, which is impossible to do when the questions come at random from the live audience. On the other hand, Aquinas took every opportunity to hold quote libidal disputations while he was teaching at the University of Paris. Every semester he was there, he held them. Uh, and that's something he did not have to do. And he also took the time to edit and publish the text from all but the last quodlibidal session. So he must have considered quodlibidal disputations worthwhile, even if he thought they weren't best for beginners. Aquinas's quodlibidal questions tell us a lot about him as a thinker. They obviously make it clear how he wanted to respond to the questions raised during his general disputations. But since we can date these disputations fairly confidently, the quodlibidal questions also help us to understand what Aquinas was thinking on certain issues around or not long after the time the disputations took place. So dating the quodlibets allows us to identify developments in Aquinas's thinking over time, given that he conducted quodlibidal disputations both early and late in his relatively short writing career, some 20 years. I've already been writing for about 10 years. I'm not even close to 4 million words. So I don't expect I'll get to Aquinas's point in 20 years, if I even live that long. <laughs> in any case, um, interestingly, the quodlibido questions also give us a sense of the issues that were on the minds of Aquinas's contemporaries and of what his critics wanted to argue with him face to face. Some of these issues were ones to which theologians had long paid attention, but some of them, such as the questions dealing with secular priests and members of religious orders, clearly spring from new discussions taking place at Paris while Aquinas was there. Um, in fact, the debates about members of religious orders may even have occasioned Aquinas's return to teach at Paris a second time. Uh, the secular masters, so secular priests and um, clerics who were teaching at the university were not happy with Franciscans and Dominicans, religious priests and clerics coming in and taking their chairs of theology and philosophy and so on. And so they um, began to call into question the very legitimacy of Dominican and Franciscan religious life. Because unlike monks that stay in one place, Dominicans and Franciscans travel around. They're called itinerant preachers. And unlike monks who work and pray or at labora, the Franciscans and Dominicans begged for money instead. They were mendicants. They lived on donations. Um, and this called into question the legitimacy of their very way of life, which was very convenient for the secular masters who wanted their chairs of theology back, because, of course, they wanted their money back. Anyway, so Aquinas engaged in this debate, and uh, there's evidence of that even in the quote libidal uh, questions. I won't get into that, but... Um, it's, it's an interesting fact about the quote libidal questions that they give you some of these live debates at the time in which Aquinas was basically defending the very legitimacy of his way of life and his right to be at the university at all. I mean, when he gave, sorry, I'm going on about this, but when he gave his inaugural sermon, when he took his chair in theology, there were literally riots and fisticuffs in the streets outside as he was preaching uh, <laughs> um, on the occasion of taking up his chair of theology. So um, anyway, the questions discussed in Aquinas's Code Libidals are many and various. There are more than 260 different questions for an average of about 20 per session. Uh, all of the quod libits, none of which come with titles, typically begin with a brief note indicating what sorts of questions they contain. Then we have the questions, which are often divided into a number of articles, which are the real questions, usually amounting to a total of between 15 to 25 articles. Aquinas organizes each quod libit along the same lines. He always begins with questions about God and angels before turning to questions about human beings and the rest of creation, 
He tends to raise philosophical questions that can be settled by reason alone before raising theological questions that depend in some way on revelation. And he also tends to start with metaphysical and epistemological questions before turning to questions about ethics and politics. The main topics treated in Aquinas' Quod Libidals can be grouped roughly under the following headings, the divine nature, God is triune and incarnate, angels, blessedness, damnation, grace, sin, human nature, matters concerning clerics and members of religious orders, which I was just telling you about, pastoral concerns, including the sacraments, and the category that I <laughs> came up with for the introduction, motley questions that resist easy categorization. Um, rather than giving you an overview of Aquinas' treatment of these topics, however, as, as we do in the introduction, uh, I'd like to highlight a few particular questions, which I think reveal some interesting things about the nature and purpose of these open debates, at least as Aquinas saw them. Before I turn to these particular questions, however, let me say something about what I think generally motivated all such debates. As I said earlier, the practice of disputation arose at the medieval university out of a respect for the value of dialogue and dialectic as a way to pursue a better understanding of the truth, especially the truths of faith and those related to faith. But why did people at medieval universities see dialogue and dialectic as such a valuable way to pursue an understanding of the truth? One of the main reasons, I think, is that they were all Christians, generally committed to the fundamental compatibility and complementarity of faith and reason as two different ways of coming to the truth. In the Christian worldview, God is the creator of all things in heaven and on earth, and that includes human beings with all their innate capacities, such as the capacity to reason. Indeed, Christians believe that human beings are made in the very image and likeness of God, and that that image and likeness consists primarily in their endowment with intellect and will. Reason was thus seen as a gift of God, given to lead us to a knowledge of the truth. That's why people at the medieval university didn't shy away from the use of reason to investigate and examine the truth that they took on faith, for they believed that both faith and reason came from God, and thus could not ultimately be at cross purposes with one another. Instead, they generally thought that faith could enlighten and expand what reason can know, and that reason could support and deepen the understanding of what faith reveals. This positive view of the role of reason in the life of faith comes out clearly in Aquinas's reply to a question from the floor during his fourth quod libido disputation. Should a master make more use of reason or of authority when settling theological questions? The argument from the floor on the side of authority points out that questions in any discipline are best settled with the first principles of that discipline, and the first principles of theology are the articles of faith, which are taken on authority. The articles of faith here refers to those things summarized in the Christian creeds, which are taken ultimately on the authority of God who reveals them. Since theology rests ultimately on divine revelation, one might think that theological questions should be settled by appeal to the authority of revelation. But in his own reply, Aquinas takes the side of reason instead. He first points out that every activity should be performed in a way conducive to the end at which it aims. He then distinguishes two different kinds of debates aimed at two different ends. Some debates aim to remove doubt about whether this or that is the case. In theological debates of this kind, Aquinas says that most use should be made of the authority accepted by both sides in the debate. So in a debate with Jews, for example, Christians should appeal to the Old Testament, whose authority they both accept, rather than to the New Testament, which only Christians accept. With those who accept no such authority, however, Aquinas says that we have to rely on reason alone to convince them, presumably since that's all we have in common with them. But then Aquinas notes that there are other kinds of debates that he says involve masters at schools and are not about correcting errors, but about instructing the audience and helping them to understand the truth they already believe. In these debates, Aquinas says that reason should be used to get at the heart of the truth and enable people to know just how it is true. If the master settles the question by mere authority instead, the audience may be assured that this or that is the case, but they will not acquire any knowledge or understanding of it, thus going away empty, Aquinas says. It's not that Aquinas believed in the limitless potential of human reason to discover, demonstrate, and deepen our understanding of the truth, whether revealed or otherwise. He recognized both faith and reason's limits. This comes out, for example, in the way that he deals with a pressing question at the time, 
Is it possible to prove demonstratively that the world is not eternal? Christians at that time believed that God had revealed in the book of Genesis, for example, that the world, that is the entire universe, had a beginning in time and had not always existed. But the metaphysics of Aristotle had recently been recovered and translated into Latin for the first time, and in it, Aristotle attempted to demonstrate that the world was eternal. This was one reason that the reading of Aristotle was forbidden at the University of Paris by ecclesiastical authorities, thus guaranteeing that everyone read it. Um, in any case, Aquinas believed that Aristotle's attempt to demonstrate the eternity of the world had failed, since it could, uh, since it, um, excuse me, uh, since it couldn't possibly be successfully demonstrated that the world was eternal if it was not, and Aquinas believed as a matter of faith that the world was not, in fact, eternal. But the question was, can this matter of faith also be demonstrated by reason? And Aquinas's answer, and here he disagreed with some of his most eminent contemporaries, such as St. Bonaventure, Aquinas's answer was no, reason cannot demonstrate that the world is not eternal. As Aquinas explains in his third quadlibital disputation, things that are up to God's sheer will are impossible to prove demonstrably, and the creation of the world depends on no other cause than God's will alone. Hence, he thinks that things about the beginning of the universe are impossible to prove demonstrably. They have to be taken on faith, as they have been revealed prophetically by the Holy Spirit. Aquinas then issues an important warning. He says that we should be extremely wary of anyone presuming to offer demonstrations of matters of faith. Again, those things summarized in the Christian creeds. And he gives two reasons why. First, he says, trying to demonstrate matters of faith detracts from the excellence of faith, whose truth surpasses all human reasoning. He then quotes the book of Sirach. Many things beyond human understanding have been shown to you. Second, we should be wary of attempts to demonstrate matters of faith, he says, because many of the arguments offered for them are silly, which gives non-believers cause to laugh at us believers, thinking that we believe the matters of faith for such silly reasons, rather than because they have been revealed by God. He then cites as examples the two arguments from the floor that had attempted to demonstrate that the world is not eternal which he says are ridiculous and have no force. He doesn't usually talk that way, so he must really have thought very little of them. Um, I won't waste your time with the arguments themselves, but it's worth mentioning that Aquinas points out that the first argument is only an argument from authority, which he says is not a demonstrative proof. Arguments from authority only lead to belief or opinion, he says. And here I think Aquinas gives a nod to his view of the limits of faith. Although faith is supposed to be certain, based as it is on the authority of God himself, the first truth, nevertheless, Aquinas insists that faith is not itself a case of knowledge. Faith is not knowledge. The certainty of faith, he thinks, comes from the side of the will, which clings unyieldingly to the truth revealed by God because it is revealed by God. Faith certainty does not come from the side of the intellect, which Aquinas says is always restlessly probing and searching trying to understand how the things believed by faith can be true. In spite of its limits, however, Aquinas saw human reason as a gift given by God to lead us to a knowledge of the truth, a great good to which he thinks human beings are above all attracted. Aquinas even defends the good of knowing magic, which was forbidden at the time. Good news for you, Harry Potter fans. In his fourth quadlibital disputation, he's asked whether even the desire to know magic is a sin let alone actually knowing it or using it, just wanting to know it. Now, the first argument from the floor in defense of such a desire is classically Aristotelian. It argues that it's not a sin to desire anything that turns the intellect to what is best, which is what any kind of knowledge does, since knowledge is about truth, which is the good of the intellect, to use Aristotle's phrase from book six of the ethics. Hence, it is permissible to desire any kind of knowledge, including knowledge of magic. Aquinas does, uh, defends this line of thinking in his own reply to the question, insisting that all knowledge is good, even knowledge of evil. Otherwise, God, who does nothing evil, would not know everything, including evil. Nevertheless, Aquinas does point out that the desire to know magic, while a good kind of thing, can still be bad in certain circumstances, such as wanting to know about magic in order to use it rather than to refute it, or preferring it to better things. He also points out that the art of magic was only forbidden to use. Yet even if it were forbidden to study, perhaps because of the risk of then going on to use it, 
Aquinas says that such knowledge would still only be evil because of being forbidden. So the disobedience to the authority that forbid it, not evil in itself. Knowledge draws human beings so much because of the attractive power of truth, the good of the intellect, which is what knowledge is about. Like Aristotle, Aquinas did not think that one could know what is not true. Aquinas discusses this power of truth in reply to the question, is truth stronger than wine, kings, and women? At first, I thought this question from the floor was a case of typical university student antics, looking for some comic relief at an open debate, but in fact, it was deadly serious. The question had been debated in the Old Testament book of Esdras, which says that truth is strongest. Yet an argument from the floor suggests otherwise. Quote, wine seems strongest since it affects people the most. Kings seem strongest since they make people do the most difficult thing, namely risk their lives. Women seem strongest since they even control kings. In his own reply, Aquinas points out that taken in themselves, wine kings, women, and truth are incomparable since they aren't things of the same kind. You can't compare them to see which is stronger. Um, that borders on nonsense or a category mistake. But he says, if you consider them all in relation to a certain effect, then they can be thought of as the same and compared accordingly. And the effect that they all share, he says, is their effect on the human heart. Hence, he thinks we should see which one affects the human heart the most. He first points out that human beings can either be affected in body or in soul, and that the effects on the soul come either through the senses or the intellect, which is either practical when the intellect is concerned with doing, or speculative when the intellect is concerned only with knowing. He then grants that of all the things that can naturally affect the body state, the greatest is wine, which he says, quote, makes everyone talk too much, a line from the book of Esdras. Of all that can affect the sense appetites, that is the desires aroused by sensation, he grants that the greatest is pleasure, especially sexual pleasure. And in that respect, he says, women are strongest. In practical matters and in things that people can do, the concerns of the practical intellect, he grants that kings have the most power. But in speculative matters, that is, those of the speculative intellect concerned only with knowing, the greatest and most powerful thing, he says, is truth. Aquinas then quickly puts them all in order. The body's powers are below those of the soul, the sense powers are below those of the intellect, and the practical intellect is below the speculative. Hence, absolutely speaking, truth is the best, greatest, and strongest. Now, I don't have time to explain and justify Aquinas' ordering of the capacities of our nature here, or to do damage control over his association of women with sexual pleasure. What I want to emphasize is that he thinks the power of knowledge comes from the attractive force of truth, which has the greatest effect of all on the human heart. For Aquinas, knowledge is not something constructed as a means of imposing power on other people. The only power that knowledge has over people comes from the persuasive force of truth, which is what knowledge is about. Just how far Aquinas is from the more cynical view of knowledge as power prevalent in universities today comes out in his answer to a question about whether it is morally permissible for a man to seek his own license to teach theology as a master at the university. In order to answer the question, Aquinas first notes three differences between a master's chair and a bishop's chair. It'd be good if some of uh, our colleagues knew that difference. The first difference, he says, is that a master's chair does not involve receiving a superiority that one previously lacked. It just involves receiving the opportunity to share the knowledge that one already possessed. I'll say that again. The first difference between a master's chair and a bishop's chair is that a master's chair does not involve receiving any superiority that one previously lacked. It just involves receiving the opportunity to share the knowledge that one already possessed. For a license doesn't give a man knowledge, it just gives him the authorization to teach. Whereas a bishop's chair actually does give the man a superior power that he previously lacked. The second difference between them, he says, is that the superior knowledge required for a master's chair is a matter of one's own personal perfection, whereas a bishop's superior power does not come from his own person, but presumably from Jesus Christ, whose flock a bishop cares for. The third difference between them, Aquinas says, is that having great charity is what makes a man fit to be a bishop, whereas it is having enough knowledge that makes a man fit to be a master of theology. If only it were the opposite way. 
After noting these three differences, Aquinas explains that it's praiseworthy to desire something related to one's own perfection, and hence the desire for wisdom is praiseworthy. As the Book of Wisdom says, the desire for wisdom leads to an everlasting kingdom. But the desire for power over others is vicious, Aquinas says, quoting Gregory the Great, who says that it is unnatural pride for one person to want to rule over another. Hence, if a master's chair gave one superior wisdom, as a bishop's chair gives one superior power, then a master's chair would be as worthwhile to pursue as a bishop's chair is shameful to pursue. But since receiving the license to hold a master's chair only involves the opportunity to share what one already possesses, there's no shame in seeking such a license considered in itself. For it is praiseworthy and charitable to share one's knowledge with others, Aquinas says, quoting the Book of Wisdom and First Peter. What I've learned without deceit, I share without envy. As each has received a gift, use it for one another. Nevertheless, Aquinas points out that there can be shame in seeking the license to teach presumptuously, that is, when someone unfit to teach seeks the office of a teacher. So Aquinas thinks that a teacher commands no more authority and has no more right to be believed than the persuasive power of the truth of his own knowledge. It is for this reason that Aquinas also thinks that students are not excused from the sin of error if they follow the false opinions of their own masters. This question comes up in his third quote, Libido Disputation. It was obviously motivated by the fact that different masters of theology might hold different opinions and even teach opposite things on the same question. As I told you that Aquinas and Bonaventure held opposite views on whether the eternity of the world could be disproven. So when people hear different masters holding differing opinions, are they excused from the sin of error if they follow the false opinions of their own masters? That is the question. In reply, Aquinas says that if such masters' differing opinions do not bear on faith and good morals, then their hearers can follow any of their opinions without danger. He cites St. Paul as allowing for this in the New Testament. But if masters' differing opinions do bear on faith and good morals, Aquinas says that no one is excused from sin for following the erroneous opinion of any master. He insists that ignorance does not excuse one from sin in such cases, otherwise the followers of arch heretics like Arius and Nestorius would be free from sin. Nor can a hearer's lack of intelligence serve as, as an excuse for following an erroneous opinion on such matters, Aquinas says, for no one should give assent lightly to doubtful things. Instead, quoting Augustine, Aquinas says that everyone should consult the rule of faith found in the clearer passages of scripture and in the public teaching authority of the church. Thus, he concludes that people cannot be excused from the sin of error if they assent to the false opinion of any master of theology against such clear testimonies. Hence, Aquinas expected students of theology to think for themselves and to check the arguments even of their own masters uh, against other relevant sources of knowledge and truth, such as the Bible and the magisterium of the church. And the magisterium did weigh in on philosophical and theological debates at the time, two years after Aquinas's death, the uh, Archbishop of Paris published a condemnation of over 200 philosophical and theological theses, some of which seem to have come from the works of Aquinas. Um, anyway, um, the stakes of failing to uh, consult such other relevant sources of knowledge and truth were high, Aquinas thought, but the stakes for teachers of theology were even higher. For Aquinas saw their task as bearing on the salvation of souls. This comes out in his reply to a question in his first quote libido disputation about whether a man with an aptitude for teaching should nevertheless forego the study of theology in order to pursue the salvation of souls. In reply, Aquinas points out that there are two ways to compare things, either absolutely or in the abstract or in a specific case. For something might be better absolutely speaking, but still less choice worthy in a specific case. To use Aristotle's example, philosophizing is better than making money, but when necessary, making money is more worthy of choice. A precious stone is more valuable than a loaf of bread, except in a famine, of course. Hence, Aquinas argues that in a specific case of need, everyone ought to set aside teaching in order to pursue the salvation of particular souls. But considered absolutely or in the abstract, Aquinas argues that studying theology is better. He makes his case with an analogy to building, he points out that without it, that with any product, the architect or designer is better, absolutely speaking, than the manual laborer who produces it according to the architect's design, which is why the one is paid more than the other. 
In the case of the spiritual edifice, so to speak, the manual laborers are those who pursue the salvation of particular souls, while the principal architects, he says, are the bishops who direct the laborers and decide how they ought to fulfill their duties. But then he says that teachers of theology are also like these principal architects, since what they investigate and teach bears on how others ought to go about saving souls. Hence, teaching theology is better, absolutely speaking, than devoting particular attention to the salvation of this or that soul. Even reason, he says, shows that it is better to teach the truths of salvation to those who can benefit both themselves and others, rather than teaching those who can only benefit themselves. Because Aquinas thought that the teaching of theology bore on the salvation of souls, he also thought that teachers of theology were required to recant false teachings that led people astray. This question comes up in his fifth quotlibital disputation. The arguments from the floor point out that a teacher whose teaching draws people away from a greater good causes active scandal and spiritual harm, since what they teach informs our intellects, which informs our desires and consequently our actions. Since active scandal and spiritual harm have to be undone, it seems such teachers are required to recant their teaching. On the other hand, what if their teaching is true and people are going astray anyway? As Gregory the Great says, truth should not be denied because of scandal. In reply, Aquinas makes a distinction. If the teacher's teaching is false, then they are required to recant it, he says, especially if it causes spiritual damage. Suppose, for example, that people were being led into a religious community like the Dominicans by the teaching of certain errors, such as the claim that whoever enters that religious community would immediately merit as much heavenly reward as St. Peter himself. But if the teacher's teaching is true, then things are different. Spiritual harm can still come to their hearers, but it may not be through the teacher's own failing, in which case the teacher need not recant, he says. But the harm may well be due to the teacher's own failing. For example, a teacher might present deep and difficult matters to people who are unprepared and incapable of understanding them and have their salvation damaged as a result. Or the teacher might present things in a confusing and disorganized way. That never happens nowadays. In such cases, Aquinas says, the teacher whose teaching does spiritual damage is required to repair the damage, at least by explaining things properly. Get back in here and uh, put it in proper order. Um, so people at medieval universities like Aquinas thought that the stakes for failing to teach and learn the truth correctly were high. The medievals were serious about salvation and they were anything but soft on sin. Yet in spite of the danger they saw in teaching and believing wrongly on such serious matters of faith, people at medieval universities were still committed to open and reasoned debates in which questions about anything could be asked by anyone, and arguments on both sides of the questions had to be considered. As I've tried to explain, the medieval commitment to such open debates at the university stemmed in large part from their Christian commitment to the complementarity of faith and reason, and from their Christian view of reason as a God-given guide to knowledge, whose only force comes from the persuasive power of truth itself. If one holds the more cynical view of reason increasingly prevalent today, where reason is seen as the social construction of knowledge for the imposition of power on others, then it's not clear why a university should or would have such open debates. Power, after all, is a zero-sum game. The point of the game is to deprive all opponents of it. So if reason is primarily power, then it's not clear why arguments for the wrong ideas should be critically examined, even in order to refute them that would already seem to give them too much power. Perhaps surprisingly, it was their common Christian faith that gave people at the first medieval universities their commitment to the use of reason in open debate. Given that we no longer share a common faith in the nature, purpose, and value of reason, it's not clear what hope we should have for open debate at the university today. As Aquinas points out, even debates that aim to convince those with whom we disagree are only possible if we share something in common with them, for it's only from shared assumptions that one can ever convince anyone of anything. But the open debates held at the medieval university aimed at something deeper than correcting errors, convincing those with whom we disagree. It aimed at an understanding of the truth that they already believed. It was in Anselm's phrase, faith seeking understanding. Knowing that something is the case, that something is true, is only the beginning of reason's task. True wisdom seeks out the full significance of each truth known, all the causes and reasons why it is true, how it relates to all other truths, and so on. 
People at the first medieval universities were convinced that one cannot seek such wisdom alone and that the search required rational debate with others. If we can recover some of their faith in reason and indeed in one another, we might be able to regain some of their wisdom as well. Thank you. Yeah, this open up for questions. Very rich presentation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fisticuffs, yeah. And it kind of made me think that it was like a medieval equivalent of like Burning Man. So somebody just showed up and it just becomes a new meaning of ideas and yeah. I don't know whether whether the disputations themselves ever devolved into fisticuffs, but there were definitely uh, fights in the street for sure. Yeah, um, they were fighting over the legitimacy of Dominicans and Franciscans even teaching at the university, because secular clerics, that is non-religious priests who are not members of religious orders, had before that time held all the chairs of teaching at the university. And when the Dominicans and Franciscans were newly established, they soon came to the university, first as students and then holding master's chairs teaching. And that took money away from the secular masters who had previously held the chairs. And so there were debates about the legitimacy of these religious orders, but they were partly motivated by a wish to exclude Dominicans and Franciscans from the university. And so a master's students who would generally be on a master's side, you know, these, these two would meet in the streets, a la West Side Story, okay? First, they would have to do a dance, and then, you know, things, things would go from there. Yeah. Oh, it's okay. Yeah, delightful turn. I really enjoyed the, the presentation. Uh, so these quote liber liberal um, disputations are an opportunity for anyone that asks a question about anything. Uh, and so I'm, I'm thinking about the the outside, right? Uh, to what to what to what extent are kind of Jews or kind of Jewish theology kind of included in the debate? You, you referenced at one point um, the engagement with Jews. You have to refer only to the, the Old Testament, right? Uh, the the second part of this is to what extent are kind of is Muslim theology kind of addressed or, or introduced into to these debates? And then the, and the third question is, what about heretics? And is part of what's happening here is it's kind of shaping the boundary of what's mm. heretical or not heretical? Yes. Yeah, um, those are great questions because the picture, even the picture as I tried to present it is a complex one. You know, so I'm emphasizing the extent to which these debates were open, but of course it's open within a context, right? And so you're right um, that, uh, well, first about the, um, uh, the sorts of sources that might come in. So definitely um, Jewish sources, Islamic sources are being drawn into the debates. Aquinas is quoting Maimonides, Averroes, Avicenna, um, hugely influenced by Avicenna um, and so on. So um, definitely they're reading the sources, but um, you're right that um, everyone at the, at the early medieval University of Paris, in order to meticulously in order to matriculate or to teach had to be a cleric. You had to be un in, in some kind of a clerical state. So you had to be a Christian. There were no Jews at the university and you had to be a man. There were no women at the university because they aren't clerics. So um, it's not that women at that time were not educated at all. They weren't educated at the university. Um, I mean, most people wouldn't be educated at all, number one, and most people wouldn't be educated in schools but at home, and women would be educated either at home or in monastic schools where they would then join the monastery or something like that. Um, but um, it's true that um, not everyone would um, participate in these debates, but it's also the case that they were university-wide. I mean, classes were canceled on the days that these debates were held, and everyone could show up and did show up and people from outside, those who are interested were welcome to come in. Now, I, I don't know about um, sufficiently about the social context as to know by what means 
Jews or women would have been kept out of such debates. I, I mean, I doubt there would be guards at the door or something like that. The social context would have just provided those norms, I think. Um, so it's true that um, these were, um, in that respect, less open than um, universities today. On the other hand, uh, the debates were more open than any stage debates that we hold now. Usually the question for debate is, if there's a debate at all, the questions determine in advance and you know what the proposition is gonna be and then you'll get the arguments on both sides. We never hold quote libidal disputations, right? Uh, there are places that hold them actually. Christendom College holds them. These are the only college students I've ever met who know what a quote libidal disputation is. They're like, oh yeah, we do those. And they do. Students can come and sharpshoot professors. They ask them anything and they can propose arguments back and forth. I think it'd be a good exercise, yeah. I think it's at Christendom College. It's in Virginia, yeah. Yeah, interestingly, only Catholics are allowed to go there. <laughs> oh, and the, the final bit about heretics. Is oh yeah, heretics, yeah. Well, they come up in, in the quo libel disputations as well. Aquinas is asked the question, is it permissible to consort with heretics to have a meal with them, for example, or whatever? And basically he says that it depends on whether they have been formally convicted by an ecclesiastical court or judge of heresy or not. If their heresy is, is, is not formally determined, then you're permitted to consort with them. But once their heresy has been formally determined, then he says you're not to have anything to do with them. Is the criteria for the information that they brought into these arguments based so many on what was done by men, or did they bring in any arguments from any any women at all? Like, what was their name, that abbess around that time? Um, oh, there are many, are, yes, like, yes, yes, Hildegard of Bingen, but there are many um, medieval women authors, mostly mystics, um, who wrote um, a voluminously even. I mean, um, Hildegard is a case in point, but there are many others. And there were some women even in university circles. I mean, if you've heard the story of Abelard and Eloise, you know, he was a cleric, he was her tutor. She was known for being brilliant at Latin and um, poetry. And, and um, anyway, they, they end up having an affair, which leads to her uncle uh, sending a band of men at night to castrate Abelard. It's the Middle Ages, okay? Um, so um, anyway, that made it much easier actually for him to keep his um, vow of continence after that. Um, no, it, it's, it's a, not a joke, it's true. And the letters between them are quite affecting because she remains deeply, deeply in love with him and his heart has grown cold partly because of the castration. And so she writes him these beautiful and gushing letters and he responds in a very cold way, but he's lost his mojo. So. Um, Anyway, um, I can't think of, of, of a single case in which Aquinas or any other medieval scholastic at the university quotes a woman author. Mm -mm. Were, um, what about the other universities besides the University of Paris? Did they Oxford would be the same, yeah. Naples, it, it would be the same because it was all according to the scholastic mode and these were originally ecclesiastical institutions. I mean, even uh, the universities of Oxford and Cambridge until about 100, 120 years ago, they were almost exclusively ecclesiastical institutions and they did not have a very high reputation either. Seminaries are not place for the brightest bulbs. Um, we think of Oxford and Cambridge as you know, really elite institutions now, but they used to be basically um, you know, a collection of seminaries and they remained such even up to about 125 years ago or so. So um, precisely because they were largely ecclesiastical institutions, I mean, for the training of clerics. In the Middle Ages, it was also for the training of those who would be in government and church government and law and things like that. But these were all done by clerics. Um, I mean, clerks, like we would call them clerks, but clerk and, and cleric, this is the same category. So they're in a clerical state. Um, this is why they're often shown in, in the movies with a tonsure, you know, with the hair that just goes in the circle around the head with the bald top. That's a tonsure, which indicates that you're in a clerical state. So you're not free to marry. Yeah. Um, 
Um, I love the depiction or the thinking of Job as defending positions in a disputation. Oh, yeah. I would never have read that, yeah. that way, but now that I, you have said that I can't unsee it. Um, I was wondering if they also felt that having um, disputations like this was, did they conceive of themselves as, as doing this in a tradition or just, oh, there's a couple of uh, grounds for this in scripture? No, I, I think that they would have seen it as as uh, stemming from a tradition. It's hard to trace the historical development of this, but um, St. Anselm, the father of, of scholasticism, began holding dialogue and debate with his monks when he was abbot of Beck, before he becomes Archbishop of Canterbury. And we have some of his written dialogues. He sort of, he begins writing dialogues again in the Middle Ages after a long period of no dialogues that we um, really know of. And I think that the medieval practice of disputation at the universities develops out of this because uh, universities are a development from cathedral and monastery schools, which precede them as the primary institutions of learning. And um, the original teachers coming there would have come out of such schools. So although it's very hard to tell what was really going on in the classrooms and just the lines of all the historical development and connection, it seems that the university practice of disputatio came out of that monastic practice where um, a teacher would would be having some kind of a dialogues with his students. Yeah. Um, in the case of Anselm, I mean, it, it, it takes the use of reason and dialectic to an extreme. He almost never quotes scripture at all. I mean, that's why he's father of scholasticism, because it's reason all the way through, even though the questions are largely prompted by matters of faith that are grounded in the scripture. Um, at the university, it's, it's, it's more of a mix. There are quotations from scripture quite a bit, but reason tends to be in the driver's seat. This is why th these works are studied by historians of philosophy and not just of theology, even though Aquinas was ex professo, a master of theology, and I've been talking about masters of theology, but I'm a professor of philosophy, so why am I even here? You know, What am I doing? Well, the reason is basically comes out of what he said, that primarily the answers defended and the explanations given are given in terms of reason. And so you find a bunch of philosophy in there, not a bunch of, you know, proof texting from scripture or that kind of thing. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, sure. So just to kind of pick up on some of the things that you uh, talked about at the end. Um, so I have in my notes, um, powers to zero sum gain. Um, if, if reason is uh, primarily about power, then the implication is that we shouldn't be doing these things. So well, we should be having right, with right. that kind of interpreting that. Well, I asked a rhetorical question. I mean, my point was just that it's not clear why we should or why we would expect such debates if that view of reason right. is um, if you thought it was. Uh, the one that we operate with. Yeah, okay. precisely because if reason just is, or even just primarily is, you know, the social construction of knowledge to control others, you know, to impose power and, and that kind of thing, then the appropriate thing to do uh, with those with wrong ideas isn't to try to disprove them by a counter use of reason, but to silence them. We shouldn't let bad people exercise power wrongly, right? I mean, why would we do that? So if knowledge is seen primarily as power, then it's not clear why you would want open debate. So on that view, do you think, do you think Aquinas is putting forward, is it, is it the process that's important then, the rational process? Um, I think for them it is, yeah. I mean, that's what's so interesting, that they thought that the stakes for wrong thinking were high, right? You could lose your salvation that way. You could lose other people's salvation, guilty of sin. You get censured by ecclesiastical authorities. I mean, you know, this, this was the context. It's not just, you know, oh, free, open, uh, liberal university, you know, this isn't, you know, Mill's free play of ideas kind of thing. I mean, there are other costs to getting it wrong in this context, and yet they still insist that um, any question that that is raised has to be debated with arguments on both sides of the question. I mean, even at the beginning of the Summa Theologiae and introduction to theology, one of the first questions asked is, does God even exist? And before Aquinas gives any reason to think that God exists, he gives you three arguments against God's existence, right? Which he then uh, replies to later. But um, 
they didn't want to leave any such things, you know, uh, uninvestigated, you know. Um, and I think the reason is because they were interested in understanding, not as much, you know, just settling whether this or that is the case. They all believed in God already. They didn't have doubt about whether God existed in this context. What they wanted to do was to understand how that could be, why it was the case, you know, what it meant. Um, so it's quite a different idea about even the purpose and the use of reason and the context as well. But it's not that they didn't think that the, you know, stakes were high. I mean, yeah, the answers mattered. Right. Yeah. So it, in that sense, I mean, um, that is something similar to the idea, you know, knowledge is power. That's a way of recognizing what high stakes come along with bad ideas, you know. And, um, you know, in an interesting way, they shared that sense of the high stakes, although for different reasons. And yet they remained committed to having open debates anyway, which is interesting. I mean, it's interesting that they remain committed to this risky business, as it were, you know? Yeah. Hey, Tom. Yeah. So just follow up. Sure. So, so then, um, um, oh, right. So, it, so then a couple of things have to be present if this activity is going to take place. One would have to be, like we talked about, the sh a common shared understanding. Yeah. Is going to have to be there first. Yeah. Uh, we have to already have some common foundation of like basic beliefs, a shared worldview of some kind, you know, I mean, I would even go farther than that and, and say that something like Aristotle's view of friendship is needed, you know, a common life. I mean, people at the medieval university shared a common life as well, you know, they were people who lived in common with other people. They're all clerics. They live in clerical houses, you know, they live in a community life. Students and teachers live together, you know, in the Priory of Saint-Jacques or whatever, you know, Aquinas would be teaching primarily Dominican friars of his own order. Um, so, um, yeah, I think that a common, some some kind of common shared worldview has to be the basis for a debate, right? To the extent that we have nothing in common, we have no way of convincing each other of anything. Because I can only appeal to something that you'll accept to try to get you to go on to see the implication of something that you don't yet accept. So yeah, I, I think that... Um, if we're going to have um, open debates like this, um, even to the extent that they were open, we have to at least have some shared commitment to the nature and value of reason, to the um, role of reason within human life, to its good role, I mean, and so on and so forth. Otherwise, it's hard to see how, how we could or would have open debates. That's what I think. So uh, you're, talking, you're saying that they were discussing Aristotle. In other words, didn't Aristotle do Big time. similar? He would teach his students in some in the same type of manner when they would be discussing back and forth. Now that I don't know. Um, Plato wrote a lot of dialogues. Aristotle, Aristotle's works are like lecture notes. Maybe it was Plato, but it seems mm -hmm. to me I remember even even imagery, you know, uh, maybe paintings, maybe something somewhere where they would be in a group of students. And they'd be yes, definitely. Yeah. I mean, um, uh, the, uh, the ancient schools practice dialogue for sure. And they also lived together. I mean, so I was talking about a common life. So, I mean, uh, the ancient schools, uh, the Platonic school, the school that Aristotle founded, the Lyceum, you know, um, Plato's Academy, the Lyceum, uh, the Stoics, the Epicureans, etc. These were basically communes. These people lived together. And they practiced philosophy as a way of life. Um, so they had much more in common even than a shared commitment to certain basic principles. Um, they also had common, um, you know, mentors and common um, role models whose life they wanted to imitate. And they tended to be drawn into the school by some common experience and a common desire for the, um, to the, sort of for the solution to certain problems that they saw within their own lives that the school could offer a solution to and so on and so forth. Um, so yes, I, I, um, dialogue definitely comes out of the ancient philosophical world and it's being revived here in the 12th and 13th century. Yeah, after a long sleep. Is that it? <laughs>
Basta. You know? Yes. No, no, it, it's it's in Latin. There is a French translation, um, but no, no, the original was written in, in Latin. Yeah, about 150,000 words. It came to maybe like 180,000 English words or something like that. It's a horrible thing. Yeah. I'll never translate anything again. <laughs> Truly. It took years and years. Yeah. But I, I mean, probably it's the only thing that I'll ever do that has any hope of still being read after I'm dead. Probably. I don't expect to produce anything else that would likely be read um, after I'm gone. But um, English translations of Aquinas are not that frequently done. And um, Oxford University Press at least keeps things in print longer than almost anyone else. <laughs> I can't remember four, maybe three or four or five, something like that. While I was trying to get tenure. It took Julia Child a lot longer for her to write the French chapter. Oh, of course, sure. No, that's true. So yeah. That's not bad. Yes. No, that's right. No, you're right about that. Yeah. So it, it isn't such a great accomplishment. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm just teasing. Yeah. No. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.